What's up, everyone? Welcome to Unmasked, where things are discovered, uncovered, brought to the light, and made known. I'm your host, Lamar Barrett, coming live to you from PG County, Maryland. If you're interested in finding out about the untold stories behind being a college coach, this is the show for you. Being a former assistant men's college basketball coach for 16 years, there are so many untold stories in the life of a college basketball coach. Now, let's unmask them. Today's guest is a former head coach, a longtime assistant coach, a great mentor and friend, and a Greenville, North Carolina native who grew up in Danbury, Connecticut, Larry Harrison. Now, Larry Harrison is a former player, uh, graduated from uh, University of Pittsburgh. Uh, from there, he was a high school assistant for a few years, and then he went on to Hillsborough Community College for a couple of years. Then he was an assistant coach at American University for three years before heading to Cincinnati, uh, uh, Cincinnati, University of Cincinnati, where he spent eight years there, four as the associate head coach before going to DePaul for three years, 1997 to 2000. And then he became the head coach at, uh, at Harford University, um, where for six years, um, he took a program that was uh, struggling. He did um, a decent job there at Harford. And then he, for a year, you know, he, he uh, went to scout with the Washington Wizards. Uh, and then uh, from there, he went back to a former, a familiar guy that he worked with for eight years at uh, University of Cincinnati in Bobby Huggins, where he has been there presently for the last 13 years, 11 years as the associate head coach. I want to welcome to the show. Now, this is a guy who's been in college coaching for 35 years. Still a young man in this business, um, somebody I look up to um, in this business. But I want to welcome to the show, uh, Coach Larry Harrison. Thanks, Lamar. I, I appreciate uh, the invite. I appreciate being able to come on and, and, and share with you the, the journey that I've had in this business and, um, you know, and just talk about the business and how great it's been for me and, and uh, looking forward to sharing my story. Thank you again, man. So, okay, Larry, let's get right to it. Let's get unmasked. Uh, one of the first things I like to ask, and you've been in it, um, you know, as I mentioned, 35 young years, as I'm going to say. Um, and you, like, you can go back to the days when you first started at American and, um, or whenever you, Cincinnati, wherever it was. But, like, we all know there's no handbook into being a college coach. There's no, you know, there's no, no one telling you when you come in the door what to do. Um, especially like, I mean, it just, that's just how it is. It's figured out. But like, can you remember, tell me about your first day, that first week, first month after things are done with human resources, um, or, or orientation, like, let, let me know, tell me what that was like. Well, Lamar, to be honest with you, I, I, I got into business probably a, a, a lot different than, than the guys that are getting in, into the business today. You know, back when I first broke in, um, you could have volunteer assistants. Um, um, back when I first got in, you could work basketball camps uh, with different universities to, to network and to get to know, you know, college coaches, uh, you know, at that time. So my, really my, my first division one job at, at, at American University, I was an assistant coach at Hillsborough Community College in, in Tampa, Florida. I was, I was there for two years and uh, we had uh, a couple of good players and we had coaches come down recruiting our players. And one of the coaches happened to be Ed Tapscott, who, who, who went on to, to, to have done really great and incredible things in this business, both on the college level and on the professional. But, um, you know, uh, Tab would come down and, and, and was recruiting one of our players and, you know, we would talk a little bit, communicate a little bit, and I sent him a note. You know, back then, again, we were going back a few years. Back then, it was all, you know, writing letters, you know, writing notes. There wasn't any texting or email and things like that. So uh, to get to your get to your question, um, when when one day out of the blue, uh, Tap calls me, and because I told him I wanted to get into college coaching. A D1 college coach. And out of the blue one day, he called me. He says, hey, uh, 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 I got an opening on my staff. 
uh, would, would, would you like to join on my staff and be, be an assistant? And I'm like, man, great. I was married at the time, married with two kids. And uh, I was like, great, yes, I'd love to do it, love to do it. I said, uh, you, you gonna hire me? He said, yeah, yeah. He said, if, if, if you want it, the job is yours. I'm like, okay, great. He said, well, I got one, I, I got one thing to tell you about the job. I said, well, I said, what's that? He said, you're not gonna get paid. <laughs> and I'm like, wait, wait, I'm not gonna get paid. And um, he said, yeah, he said, it's a volunteer spot. He said, but if you wanna get into business, he said, that's the way to get in. He said, but I, I you know, I help you out here and there. He said, but you know, it, it, it's an unpaid position. So, um, and again, I'm married with two kids. My wife worked for Aetna Life and Casualty at the time. I had a master's degree in special ed and, and, I, and, I, and, and I talked it over to my wife and I said, look, you can transfer to DC. I said, I'll find a job. I said, I can find a job. I said, you know, I, I, I believe in myself. I believe in, 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 in what I can do. I had a master's degree in special ed. I said, I'll find a job. I said, but this is an opportunity that, you know, you know, we, we just got to take. And, uh, you know, we just took a leap of faith and, you know, I, I packed them up on the, in a U-Haul, had the car uh, hit, uh, hooked onto the back of the U-Haul truck. And, you know, we moved up to D.C. And after about two or three weeks, uh, you, you probably know about this place, but after about two or three weeks of making phone calls and, and, and with connections and things, I got a, a job at the receiving home for children, which at that time was like, um, back then, Rafer. Rafer was like the big drug pen in DC. He had all these nine, 10, 12 year old little kids running around um, the neighborhood, you know, doing whatever they were doing for him. And police would round them up send them to the receiving home for children. We'll teach them for a couple of days. They'll go to court, they'll get back out on the street. And then, you know, it was like a revolving door. But long story short, I, I will go there and work from eight to three, leave there, drive across town to American, get there at four, stay there till around midnight. And we would do that. And, you know, back, back then, um, I, I was a video coordinator. I was director of operations. I was swept the floors, you know, all, all these positions, player development, all these positions that we have today with back in the day, as you remember, we all did those. We all did those, you know, and it would be man, I'm the manager, you know, uh, uh, make sure the floor was clean, uh, videos, uh, scheduling, all those things, and uh, but it, it was my opportunity, and that's and that's why I tell young guys today, you know, when, when they want to get into the business, I said it's different today than it was when I got in. I said, but you got to understand, your first job is not going to be the job I got today. You know, and a lot of the young guys that get into business now, they 25, 26 years old, they want my job, and as a guy. My, my first job, I worked for free. I worked for free for two years. You know, I worked for free for two years. I had a wife and two kids, you know? And so, you know, again, my experience was a little different, but then if you want to talk about human resources and, and really getting that first major job, um, well, I did get hired at American University in my, my third year and I was there for three years. You know, you go from American, which was, you know, mid to low, D1 at that time, they go to Cincinnati and it, it's a different world. It, it's a different world. You know, when, 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 when Bob Huggins uh, called me and told me my salary, told me I was going to get a car, told me they were going to pay for me to move, you know, they're going to fly me up. I'm like, man, you know, at America, we were driving buses to Wilmington, North Carolina, you know, or, or vans. So it, it, was, it was a different world. And um, I had to, you know, I had to get used to it. I, I was with people, uh, a staff that I didn't know. You know, I, I really didn't know Bob Huggins. I didn't know the, the other coaches on the staff. It, 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 it was um, 
I got hooked up with Huggins through a mutual friend. And uh, my mutual friend was Tom Crean. Tom Crean and I are one of my best, best friends today in the business. But, you know, sitting down with human resources, going through all the, the medical stuff and, and the benefits and salary. I mean, I, I kind of like tripled my salary from American to Cincinnati. So at that time, at that time, making $40,000 a year, I mean, I thought I was, you know, it was like making a million when you, when you go from making 15, you know? So it, it was a different world, but really, really excited. And, and um, you know, everything turned out well. And, you know, what, 30 years later, you know, I'm, I'm still doing it. Awesome, man. Awesome. Um, yeah, like, you said 30 years later and if times were um, totally different back then. And like you, you said, it, like, cause everyone see Larry, they say, Oh, I want to be on, I want to be at that level. They don't understand that. No college basketball is not the shiny suit and all that stuff you see on TV. There's a lot more work that goes into just seeing those games on TV in that suit and think it's, um, and think it's real nice. No, there's a lot of work that goes into that. Well, one of the questions that I know that you, you, you get, and I actually get a lot from people who don't know is the question they say, well, what, what do you do when you got a day off? You know, what do you do on your off days? You know, no day <laughs> off, no day <laughs> off. <laughs> and, and he tells them, off days, they say, even when you're off, you're not off. You know, there's no such thing. You, you go on vacation, you know, back before cell phones. Again, I'm, I'm dating myself, but back before cell phones, when we used to go on vacation, I, I, to, I used to have to negotiate a couple of hours with my wife to say, look, I need two hours, you know, two hours. Then after that, I'm all yours, you know? And, and we used to plan our vacation time, wherever we were, where I, I said, okay, these two hours, you guys go shopping or go to the amusement park or whatever the case may be. But, you know, like you said, people see the end result. They see us on the sideline with suits, they see us on TV. They don't understand that, you know, uh, we, we got a young man uh, uh, that's is trying to be a grad assistant for us uh, this year. And I'm gonna meet with him in about another half hour after we finish this. And um, and, and I gotta sit down and, and let him know and talk to him to look, is this what you really want? You know, because this is what, you, these are the steps you're going to have to take. You know, you have to be here in the morning and you're going to be here at night. You know, you're not getting paid. You're not going to, you're going to be a grad assistant. You're not going to be getting a lot of money, you know, but it's going to be a lot of work. Now, if, if, if you want to do this, you know, I tell people all the time, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's a great life. It's a great business. I've, I've, I've traveled the world, you know, I've, I've had a lot of, met a lot of people. Some of my best friends are, are, are in the business, you know, and, 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 you know, there's some negatives to it also, you know, but I, I, I wouldn't trade it for anything. Right. You're right. Um, this, speaking of a lot of that, you was talking about the phone call phone and all of that. And, and it's interesting to get to these. We all know that recruiting Larry is the lifeline of, uh, of, of coach. Like you recruit good players, good people <clears throat> who win a lot of games. I mean, that's how it happens a lot of times. And, but like, do you remember what was your best as a, as an assistant? We'll say that first because I'm gonna add something to the the head coaching part. But like, what was the best and worst recruiting story you think you've had? <laughs> wow, the best recruiting story. Probably one of the one of the the the, the, the funniest ones was uh, when I was at Cincinnati. Um, you, you know, I went to the airport and get a big Lincoln or a big Cadillac or something. And um, you know, I'll be I'll be with Coach Huggins, and um, we, we're recruiting this kid, uh, uh, John Smith, out of uh, Columbia, South Carolina, and he he went to uh, Wichita State, I think. But um, we sort of met him at his house at a certain time, and you know how these guys are; they they're never on time. So we we pull up outside the house, you know, it's it's, it's in it's, it's kind of like in the hood a little bit, you know, and so. You know, a black guy and a white guy dressed in suits, driving a Cadillac. You know, so we sitting outside in the car, and uh, we're waiting, and we're waiting, 
you know, we probably waited for maybe over, over an hour for John. And, um, you know, for whatever reason, you know, he didn't show up. Uh, his mother would come out and say, well, he says he's on his way. I don't know where he's at. So we're sitting outside and uh, these two young black guys walk by. And so uh, I rolled down the window. I said, hey man, I said, you guys seen John? You guys seen John? And they, they looked, they looked at me and they looked in the car and they saw hugs over there on the other side. And uh, the guy said, John? He said, yeah, John, John Smith. Yeah, you guys seen him? He lives right there. They said, man, we ain't talking to you guys. You guys are the heat. <laughs> <laughs> and and then they took off, and uh, we, we you know we we laugh at that to this day. But you know, but but that happens quite a bit when, like like you said, a black guy, white guy, suits, big car, going to the neighborhood. You know, you you you, you once they find out you you're a coach, you're fine. But prior to that, you got to be the heat. You got to be the police. So they kind of shy away from you. So that that's one of the funniest ones. Probably one of the scariest ones was uh, not scary, but a little different was um, again, Hugs and I, uh, we're in Cincinnati. And I tell people this all the time we recruiting Ron Artest. Now, Ron is from Queensbridge. And if anyone knows New York and Queensbridge, it's like New Jack City, you know. So we're recruiting Ron. And um, so I, we call him on the phone say, hey, man, we're on our way. You know, we'll we, 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 we come up to your place. He's a coach. Meet me on the corner. And uh, I said, no, Ryan, no, we, we got it. We got it, man. I, I know where you live, but, we, you know, we'll, 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 we'll just come straight to your house. He's a coach. Meet me on the corner. Don't come in. I said, okay, right. And I've never been to Queensbridge. So we pulled, pulled up. He's standing on the corner waiting on us. So we parked the car and like I said, just picture New Jack City. Or if you ever been to a prison yard, you know, you got the big yard and you got the, pro the project, the apartments all around. And again, black guy with a suit, white guy with a suit. We're walking in with Ron Ron and um, we're walking through the yard and everybody like yelling like, hey man, you in trouble? Hey, Ron, what's going on, man? You know, and Ron said, hey, no, everything's okay. Everything's okay. Hey, Ron, you need some help? We come down there, you need some help. And and we're like looking around like, God damn, you know, this is, this is, this is a little different here. But, um, you know, he walked us through the yard and stuff. And when we got to his apartment, he said, coach, now you see why I wanted you to meet me on the corner? <laughs> so that's a... That, that's another recruiting story that, uh, you know, when, when you go, when you go to, to those different types of environments, you, you got to be able to adjust and, you know, you, you got to be able to, uh, you know, try to communicate the best you can. <laughs> those are two good ones. Now yeah. I'm going to ask you this, like, and not, you, you don't have to be named or anything. You might say any names or anything, but like, do you recall anything where an assistant and I'm a, you can do, it's not, and, but this is a, or did a great, or a slash horrible job recruiting. Any story with that? Um, someone, someone, someone that I worked. Somebody worked for you. Somebody worked for you. Um, I, I I had an assistant when I was at Hartford. You know, we, we both know him, Chris Pompey. Chris Chris could um, he 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 could sell. What us say he 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 could sell. I mean anything. You name it. And um, once Chris zeroed in on a player, I said, Chris, we can't get him. He's the coach. I got it. I got it. And um, I mean, he, he's probably one of the best people that I've ever been associated with. You know, I was talking about a loyal guy, a guy that has your back. And if, 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 if you need if you need a guy to go get you a player, I mean Chris is that guy because he'll 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 find out who the mother is, the father is, the girlfriend, uh, you know. And and when I was at Hartford, the majority of the players that we had there 
was from the D.C., Maryland, PG County area. And I mean, Chris knew everyone. And uh, when, when, he, when he walked into the gym, you know, it, 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 he was like the mayor. Everybody, everybody knew him. He knew everyone. He talked. He, he never met a stranger. He, he's one of those guys that we all know that he, that he never met a stranger. And, and um, you know, not necessarily a story as far as uh, recruiting a particular player, but j just a guy that you feel comfortable with that could go in and recruit anyone. And even, even, even to this day, he's had different stops along the way. He, uh, if, if, you, if you look at where he's been and you look at the roster and you'll go, man, how did they get that guy? And, 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 and the, the, the one reason will, will be Chris Pompey. He, he's, he's one of the best I've ever been around. He's awesome, man. And, Coach, not only just getting players, but if you're somewhere and you say you're in the city, you can call Pompey. And he's gonna find you a soul food restaurant. Oh, oh, oh hey, <laughs> hey, he's gonna find you a soul food spot, and, and he and he might even send you the menu, you know, or, or take a picture, you know. And uh, but uh, that that's one of the things that we did. Uh, I, I used to tell him at Hartford, I said, "Look, man, work hard, then you can play hard." I said, "But we got to work first. And 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 he he, he did that. And then, like you said, when, when the night's over, matter of fact, I think we bumped into you a few places back, back in the day. <laughs> <laughs> definitely did. Definitely did. And thanks to Chris Pompey for that. Now, um, <laughs> you, um, you know, you had been a you know, long-time assistant. It's uh, time for you to get your job. So you're named the head coach uh, at Hartford. And uh, you're excited. You have your own program. Explain to people this, because I don't think people – like everyone wants to be a head coach, but everyone, you get the job, you work to get the job, but then they forget. Like, then it's like you sit down at your desk and it's like, what happens next? What's next? So what happened over those next few months? Well, like, like you said, people don't really don't understand. Remember, and, and, and if I get too long winded, just, just let me know. But remember when as an assistant you used to tell your head coach certain things, and then maybe an hour later, or even maybe the next day, he come, he asks you the same thing over, and you go, man, I just, I just told him that. I just told him that. I mean, well, he, he don't remember. And when I became a head coach, you know, and people say, okay, have a plan for the first 30 days, first 60 days. W once, once you get your team, your current team situated, because that, that's one of the questions that they ask me uh, when they introduced me as head coach. They said, well, well, well coach, what's one of the first things you, you're going to do? And I said, I need to get to know my team. I get to know my team. And, and sometimes people do it different. Sometimes people watch film of, of, of the guys from the past season. Some say, hey, I'm just going to do a clean slate and kind of figure it out myself. <clears throat> and uh, I, I, I probably did a combination of both, but I rely more on my eyes than on film. But the, the first, really the first week or two, you, you got you, you got to get the lay of the land. You know, you got you, you, you to gotta get to know your players, your current players. And, and while you get to know your current players, you know, obviously it depends on how many scouts. I got the job in um, in uh, April, uh, May, probably beginning of May, somewhere in May. So the recruiting was you couldn't go out and see anyone at that particular time. So the recruiting was all based on on, on relationships, and um, and so after you get to to get get to know your team, you also get got to get to know on campus who who you need to touch base with. Who, who the power brokers, who, who the power players are on campus as far as administrators, uh, professors, you know, people that you got to know that, to get them in your corner. And then once you get that, then you got to go in the community. You know, you got to know, okay, who do I need to meet in the community? You know, whether it's the mayor, whether it's the, 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 the guy at the YMCA, the guy at the rec center, 
you know, AAU guys, who 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 are the power brokers in you know in, in the city. So probably like I said, the first 30 or 60 days, those are the important things you gotta do. You gotta get to know your team, you gotta get to know uh, uh, the, the power brokers on campus, you gotta get to know the power brokers, the decision makers in, in, in the community, you know. And at the same time, while you're doing all that, you 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 gotta you gotta you gotta recruit. You gotta figure out what you need to if you have scholarships, what you need to to, to make make your team better. And um and, you know, and sometimes that's hard because like I said, if you haven't seen them yourself, you have to rely on on your friends to uh, uh that you build relationships with throughout the years to kind of help guide you and say, hey, this guy be good for you, this guy, you know so on and so forth. So the first 30 to 60 days is, is, is very crucial as far as getting a, um, a foundation on, 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 on how, how, you want to run your, how you want to run your program. At the same time, you're working your players out and you're kind of like getting a feel for, you know, uh, what they can do and what they can't do. And uh, so you're, you're building the foundation there as far as your philosophy um, uh, for for your program, one, one one of the one of the main things that that I always remember, and it goes back to what I was saying about remembering things. When you're an assistant, you're you're kind of like responsible for just certain things, you know, maybe certain players, uh, maybe scouting, you know, uh, maybe housing, you know, you you're only responsible for certain things. One of the things that I found out when I became a head coach is that you're responsible for everything, you know? And so you're constantly, you know, you, you, you definitely need to be organized so that you can keep track of what you need to do. And, 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 and the realization came as far as remembering things that people tell you is that you just got so many things going in your head. You know, you got a meeting with the president. You got to meet with the counselor. You got a player that's going to work out. Uh, you got to find housing. You got recruiting. And and one of the things after about a, a month on the job, you know, you go to sleep at night. And while you're sleeping, you're thinking about the job. And, and so what I started doing was I had a pad and pencil on my nightstand. And so... In the middle of the night, when I, I wake up, I'm thinking about things. I have to start writing them down because you, you you really you never sleep and your mind never rests. And that's why if, if the assistant coaches are listening to this. That's why when you tell your head coach something and he asks you about it over again, it's not that he just can't remember. He just got a whole lot of stuff going on in his head that he's got to respond, be responsible for. And, um, and it, 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 it's a job. The, the, the job becomes just as much mental as it does coaching your team. You know, we, we've all heard head coaches say, if I could just coach my team, you know, if that's all I had to do was to coach my team, I would be fine. But when you're a head coach, you, 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 not that you don't spend as much time, but you don't spend as much time coaching your team as you do off the uh, a lot of responsibility on the floor that interferes with things that you need to do on the floor. Gotcha. Good. That's a great nugget, man. Like, okay, we, we know, uh, you, I mean, you, you've been, a, you were a long time, you were a assistant for a long time and, Trust me, I know you're on top of your um, scout reports. I can even, you know, you can tell who scout reporter is doing doing the game. Like who's who's the most vocal? Who's jumping up? And I I seen you in West Virginia when you've done it. I've seen you back when you was at Cincinnati. So I've seen that. But like, do you remember the time? Like, what was your best and worst scout report? Uh, well, any, anytime you win, it's a good scout report. <laughs> And, and coach, and I say that all the time because you could do the crazy thing is you could have your best scout report, and like you could go and lose. But then sometimes you, your scout report was okay, 
you know, you miss some things here and there, you win by 20. So a lot of times it comes down to the players, but yeah, yeah. go to go like, yeah, talk about that though. Talk yeah, about yeah. that. And, and it, you know, and, 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 and you like the, as a competitor, you, you, you like the quote big games, you know, the games that, you know, like in our case, whether we're playing Kansas or we're playing uh, Duke or someone like that, you know, you, 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 you accept that challenge. And so when you go and sit down with the head coach and he says, what do you think? And then you, 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 you tell him the game plan that you came up with, hoping that it matches with what he was thinking, you know, and um, I've, I've been very fortunate that I'm with a guy that allows us to coach, not just me, but our whole staff. You know, if you come to our practices, you'll see all three assistant coaches, you know, on the floor, stopping practice, telling guys to do this and do that. And, and, and what Coach Huggins, uh, he kind of like walks around and he, he picks his spots on what to say, when to say it. And, uh, and, and when he speaks, believe me, the players understand that, okay, either we're not giving coach everything that, that he's asking for or we're doing something wrong or whatever the case may be. But very fortunate. And so with the scouting reports, he pretty much, you know, obviously, obviously, and, and I was the same way when I was at Hartford, I would let my assistants develop the, the scouting, the, the game plan. And, and I have in my head what, what I would like to do. And it, it's great when it all comes together, you know, and, um, and, 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 and as a head coach and, and with Coach Huggins, he's not always right and I'm not always right. So we kind of like put it together. And, uh, he, you know, and he allows us to get on the floor, come up with the drills that we need to defensively do certain things against certain teams. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll pick maybe two or three plays of our plays and say, Coach, I, I think this will work against their defense. And he allows you to have that type, have that type of input. So, you know, I, I said the best scouting report is always when you win. And but you do like the challenge of of, of, of developing a game plan against bigger teams, you know, the, the name team, so to speak. The worst scouting report is, is, is when you know, two things. One, someone that's not on the scouting report. <laughs> you know, if, if if sometimes sometimes you as you go through the, the, the personnel, you list certain players and then maybe like that ninth or tenth guy, you might have have like a little blur, you know, just right handed, you know, okay shooter, you know, whatever. And then that guy comes in a game and and he makes like two or three jump shots. And then coach will turn around and look at you like, who's that? And you would go like, oh, I can't believe this guy. I can't believe this guy is making shots, you know? And it's a coach. He, he, he don't play coach. He never plays. And again, you've been in a situation, sometimes the language gets a little, well, he's playing now, you know, and he's killing us, you know? Why didn't we know about this guy, you know? And, so those are the time, you know, those are the scouting reports when you when you pay attention to to certain players that instead of playing two minutes a game for for whatever reason, somebody might be hurt or whatever the case may be, um, uh, that player comes in and and, and has a great game. <laughs> so true. Now I will ask you this because you just said it was funny. That kid, like you, you're the head coach now. Any story that sticks out that, you know, like you said, God don't put him on the scout report. You may have turned around and gave him a few choice words, like, I mean, oh, he, he can't, he, he can't, he can't shoot, huh? But I had a little ex expletives in it. But like anything that sticks out like that, or like, like you just said, who is that guy? Anything stick out that when you was at Hartford? Um, probably. Um, we were playing Vermont one year and um, I can't remember the kid's name now, but 
he he was he was just he was just a role player. He was just a role player. And um, matter of fact, I think the, the kid again, I can't remember his name, but I think he's a coach now. He might he might be coaching on Vermont. Or he Cal Suplicky. Cal Suplicky. Um, no, no, he he was a guard. He was a guard. Oh, okay. He was a guard. And um, it, it might have been I can't I can't remember his name, but anyway, he was just a role player. I mean, guys. He, he was either the point guard or the off guard, but uh, he was killing us. I mean, just killing us. And I and I turned to the staff, and I like we getting beat by effing whatever the kid's name is. I mean, I can guard him. I mean, you know, and and it was one of those. The kid had a game of his life, and uh, it, it might have been Saplicky or someone like that that was, was was just a facilitator, you know, very rarely shot the ball. And, um, but um, I, I don't know whether it was Pompey or Grasso or one of those other guys that I would, that I turned to and I was like, I can't believe we're getting beat by this guy. We're getting beat by this effing bum, you know? And um, um, that's, I, I, that sticks out of my mind because I, I you know, we. Vermont had a really good team, and we were playing really, really well. And we, we, we was guarding the guy that we needed to guard, and we left this guy open, and he kept making shots. And um, that uh, I, I would never forget. That. I can't remember. Like there might have been some. It might have been Kyle. I can't remember his, his name, but if I like I said, he, he was on Vermont staff uh, a few years back, and. Um, and whenever I see him on the road, I just always tease him about it. I was like, you got me fired, you know? <laughs> but I uh, know, but it was, it was all good. It was all good. <laughs> um, biggest challenge you've, uh, you have experienced since um, you've become a college coach? The biggest challenge? Probably... Um, mm, well, recruiting-wise, re recruiting-wise, probably the biggest challenge was uh, when we got a job here at West Virginia. And, um, and the reason why I say that is because people ask me, they ask me all the time, they said, you know, what's, what, what, what's the challenge to, to, to recruit in West Virginia? And I said, the number one challenge to recruiting here it's perception, you know, perception. Um, you know, prior to coming here to West Virginia, I probably thought and felt the same way about the state that everybody do, you know. You know, you just got the old stereotype. And once you get here and you get to know the people, you see the, the, uh, the, the environment, the university, the support, the facilities, and all of that, you're like, wow, man, this is, this is this is a great place. This is not anything that you, you know, that you thought of, you know. And and, and I think when people, you know, it's like okay, when you when you hear Duke, you think of you think of certain things. You think of North, you hear North Carolina, you think of certain things. And you hear West Virginia, you got certain thoughts. And so I, I think one of the biggest challenges uh, for me was recruiting here to West Virginia, you know, we, we, we pretty much get who we want. <clears throat> um, the other challenge I would think was when I was at, when I took the job at DePaul. Um, and even though DePaul was in the city of Chicago, uh, their facilities at that time was subpar compared to everybody else in the, <clears throat> excuse me, in the, in the conference. And so, you know, it's now instead of selling or, or talking about the university, you talk about the city, you talk about Chicago. And so even though you're trying to recruit kids to come to DePaul, you're really recruiting kids to come to Chicago. And back then, you know, the Bulls was rolling. I was there from 97 to 2000. So, so some of the things that was on the last dance, I was there in, in the city when that was going on. And so, you know, you, 
you 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 sell Michael Jordan, you sell the Bulls, you know, you tell me you, you tell them that you're playing in the United Center when when really you're playing in all state arena, which was a dump. You know, so you know, so, sometimes as coaches you gotta you gotta um or they embellish the the, the 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 story a little bit to make it sound a lot better than what it really is. And uh but you know those are those are like probably a couple of challenges I had as far as career moves that I had to make from Cincinnati to DePaul and then from from um when I left Hartford and went to the Wizards for a year and then coming to West Virginia. Awesome. Um I, I know, you know, I've known you probably known you now, you know, probably from twenty years, you know, just um probably a little bit longer than that, but and I know what type of, you know, great person you are. That's from a coach's standpoint and off the floor. But do you ever find that there are things about you that people misunderstand? Or what are they? Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not a self-promoter, you know? So I think my actions speak louder than my words. Uh, I think people that do know me and do know of me um, know what kind of person, what type of personality I have, what type of work ethic that I have. But um, sometimes people uh, mistake, you know, um, your quietness for weakness. Um, and um, you know, they don't think that you're approachable uh, because, you know, when you walk in the room, you're not loud, you're not, you know, going around slapping everybody's hands. You you kind of like address the people that you know, acknowledge the people that you know. And then, you know, in my case, I have no problem with um, uh, sitting next to a stranger, a uh, coach that I don't know, and, and 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 talk to them about whether it's whether it's a game that we're watching or the business or whatever the case may be. But I, I think guys like myself that are not self promoters, I think sometimes we get lost in the shuffle because uh, you know what they say is the squeaky wheel gets the grease, you know. Mm-hmm. And um, I'm 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 not that guy. True and. But like I said, until people get to know you, you know, I understand you. Like, you're, yeah, you're definitely – you're not a self-promoter and you're an outstanding person, not just a basketball coach. Um, what would you – and I know we're all educated in this business, and I know, you you know, you're always developing – not young men all, um, on the court, but all, also off the court. But, like, what would you – what would you try to teach your players besides basketball? Just to do right. You know, just, just just to do right. You know, we I you know, like I said, I I, I didn't come up through this business, you know, with, with a with a, a big pedigree, you know, with you know, um like people know Bob Huggins and you know, because of you know, he's he he wins a lot of games, he's a certain style, got a certain personality. Um but just like myself, Bob is not a self-promoter, you know. And one of the things that that that, that I tried to tell my players is that I wasn't always like this, you know. I I didn't always make six figures, you know. Uh, I didn't always have the house and the car, you know. And um, and 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 I try to get them to understand that. The opportunity that they have playing college basketball, you 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 got you got to you got to use that and don't just be in the moment and then when it's over with, you look back and it it passed you by, you know. They and I, I I would like for all 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 my players that I tell them you know get to know people in in, in the college community. Get to know people, students outside of basketball, you know, because some of those people are going to be presidents, 
presidents of companies. Some of those people are gonna, gonna, gonna be in a position, maybe someday you might be able to help them or they might be able to help you. You know, so the networking thing and, and, and just developing yourself as, as a person. Um, I mean, that's, that, that, that's my big thing, you know. I, and I think we, we, we've done, I say we, because it's not just a one man show. I think as, as coaches that I've been around, we've done a really good job of developing that relationship with our guys where they look at us more than just coaches, you know, you know, mentors, uh, you know, we're, 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 we're mom and dad to a lot of these guys, you know, and so we have to carry ourselves, you know, a certain way because be, be besides their mom or a lot of our guys who dads are not in the picture, we're probably the most influential person that they have in their life, you know, so you know, it, you know, sometimes they listen, sometimes they don't, but as a coach and as a mentor, you know, I always, I always tell them, I'm going to treat you like you're my child, you know, that you're my son, you know, and then, so if I see you doing something that you shouldn't, I'm going to address it. I'm going to let you know, you know, and, 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 and I think if, if you, if you will go back in your past, if you think about some of the most influential people in your life, besides your parents, it was always the one that probably gave you the hardest time. Probably the guy that was on you the most about doing the right thing. And, and, and at that time, you know, we all, you know, we all came through the ranks and sometimes we listened and sometimes we didn't. But as you get older and when you confront those situations, you know, it's like our parents used to tell us, and like as, as coaches, we tell our guys, they that the little voice, you know, in your ear. They say, hey, man, you know, coach told me this was going to happen. Or my mom and dad said that I was going to be in this situation. And, and as coaches, just like as parents, we just got to hope that they make the right choice. You know, we just got to hope they didn't make the right decision. And, and I tell our guys, we'll see you, I say, hey, you know, you know, I, I, I you, you, you had said in my bio that I grew up in Danbury, but really, I, uh, from from second grade to eighth grade, uh, I, I was in Newark, New Jersey. And then I moved, then, then I moved to Danbury, Connecticut, and you know, you, you see a lot of stuff. And any time in our lives, you can go right or you can go left, and when you, when you, most of the time when you get into college, you, that's when you have to make those decisions. You know, you know, your coach might be there to help guide you, but you still got to make the decision. And you have friends, I have friends that is either dead, in jail, or are doing the right thing. And, and I tell our guys all the time, I could have very easily been one of those guys. Sure. I could have very easily been one of those guys. And fortunately for me, I had basketball and I had a coach that, you know, kind of like kept me going in the right path. But I tell them, I'm no different than you, you know. And, um, and then I think once, once the players try to understand, they, they don't totally understand. But once they understand that, hey, I, I, I wasn't born – like this, you know, <laughs> I came up the same way you did, you know, you know, some worse, some better, but I, I think as coaches, we got to get our guys to understand who we are as, as a person and not just who we are as a coach. So true. Um, what qualities, you know, when you got that job, like what qualities did you look for in hiring assistant coaches? Uh, loyalty. You know, loyalty. You know, um, being an assistant coach. Uh, uh, the one thing that I, I think that that you you have to understand is that you you have to be loyal to your boss, to the head coach. And the head coach is not always going to be right, 
but he's the head coach. You know, he's the head coach. And I think sometimes as assistants, and then I, I see it more, I see it more today than I have in the past. But sometimes as assistants, we think we know more than what we know. And when you make a suggestion to the head coach, that's what it is. It's a suggestion. And then you leave it alone. And if he, if he, if he listens to you, fine. If he don't, that's fine too. But you can't be disloyal and go behind his back and say, well, we would have did this, or we would have done that. You know, now you get dissension within your staff, you get some backstabbing going on. So when I was hiring an assistant coach, I would ask people that knew the person that I was interested in. And I'll say, what you know, tell me what kind of person is he? Is he gonna be loyal? You know, you know, I, I you know, I want somebody to know what they're doing. But I also want someone to understand that I'm the head coach. And, and I should tell our guys on the sidelines, I should tell my assistant coaches, I said, look, you guys talk to me. I'm, I'm walking up and down the sideline. I said, just, you got something to say, just say it. I might acknowledge you, I might not, but just, you know, you got something to say, you got suggestions, say it. And, you know, it might click. You know, because sometimes as a head coach, I'm on the side, I'm, I'm, I'm watching the game and I'm thinking one thing and one of my assistant coaches say the same thing. I'm like, oh, okay, good. You know, you know, that, you know, that, that might be a good thing to do. Or one of my assistant coaches might say something that I really don't want to do and, and I, you know, I don't acknowledge it. But as a head coach, you got to have your, assistant coaches understand that that's what they are. They're assistant coaches and they're there to help you be a better head coach. And, you know, I've been assistant coach for a lot of years. And like I said, I've been fortunate to work with Coach Huggins, who allows me a lot of freedom to coach our team, which is kind of like unusual for a lot of, a lot of programs. If, if, if you come to our practices or you watch our games, you know, Coach Huggins allows, gives me a lot of leeway as far as my input into what we do and how we do it. And, uh, but that comes through trust, through loyalty that he knows that I know he's the head coach. And if I say something, he likes it, fine. If he don't, we move on. But I, I think the biggest thing in this business as an assistant coach, is, is loyalty, you know, X and O's, and, and obviously, you know, the personality to be able to recruit, you know, but if you don't have loyalty in your staff, the recruiting and all that stuff, you, you, you're not, you're not going to have a good staff. You're not going to have a good staff. So correct. So now you, you get your job, you, you've gone through, you know, you get the job in May, You've had, you know, back then, it was, summer workouts wasn't really big as much, um, you know, and like it is now with guys in summer school all summer. Um, but you may have had a couple of guys up. And then it gets to, you know, it's October, uh, time for practice. What was your – so that was your show. What was the first – that first practice like? And then that first game when you finally control of your program. What, what was those two things like? Um, when I became a head coach, um, Coach Huggins told me, he said, whatever you do, make sure it looks like you. I really didn't understand what he meant, but make sure it looks like you. But the first day, the first practice, it, it, it was like a kid in a candy store. I mean, I was so excited and you kind of like setting the, the, the foundation of your philosophy on what the program is going to be like. Because like you said, you know, you might have one or two guys there for the summer, you know, guys do certain things that you might have to discipline them and, or, 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 you know, you pat them on the back or whatever the case may be. But when you have them all together, and then you try to put in your 
philosophy, both on the offensive end, defensive end, your practice, how you want to practice, how long you practice. You put that all together and you, you know, you, you just get immersed in it where that you just, you know, things just start happening, you know, and you start thinking about, you know, what, what would coach Huggins do? What would Pat Kennedy do? What would Ed Tapscott do? And then you get on the phone with and say, Hey, this happened, that happened, you know, so you're constantly reaching out to your mentors or other coaches that you know and exchanging ideals because you wanted to, as, as, as Coach Huggins said, you wanted to look like you, but right now it doesn't look like you, you know, because it's all new. And um, I remember when I got that, when I took over the Hartford job and we had nine guys returning. And I'm like, Man, nine guys returning. They just played a whole year. I said, we, we can't be that bad. You know, I mean, we, we, we can't be that bad. And um, and we start practicing. We start, you know, getting better, getting better. And then we had our first scrimmage against Maris. And uh, I'm all excited. You know, I got my offense in. I got my defense in. And the guys are playing well, and I'm I'm thinking, you know, you know, we're gonna go up there and we're gonna execute. We're gonna play really well, and we went up to Maris and scrimmaged them, and they just blew us away. And everything that, w w whether it's my offense, plays that I was trying to run didn't work. Defensively, things that I wanted to do wasn't working. And after that scrimmage, I went back to the office and, and I was like, I felt like I was, I was back at zero. I was back at ground zero. And because it was, it was nothing like I had envisioned. You know, and then, you know, you talk to people that said, patience, patience. But, you know, you're a head coach. You know, you think you're the John Wooden of basketball. You got all the answers. But your team is not performing the way that, you would like them to. The team is not looking like you. And I think as a head coach, especially, and I don't know, obviously we probably talk about this a little later, but the jobs that we get, and I say we, majority of African-American coaches, the job that we get are normally jobs that, you know, someone's gotten fired. And if you get fired from a job, it's probably because you don't have good enough players or guy didn't do a good enough coaching, whatever the case may be. But it's an upstart job. You know, you got to, you got to get them better. Got to get better players. And, um, and uh, my first year was a struggle because you had to put the system in, the philosophy in. And, um, but once that first year is over and, and you look back on the season, I think you're 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 much more prepared going into your second year, your third year, and I think we improved each year that I was at Hartford, but that 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 first year was really tough because what I envisioned as what my team would look like um, for whatever reason we wasn't able to get to that point, but um, it's it, 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 it's tough because. As an assistant, you know, you practice and then you move on. As an assistant, you lose, you feel it. You feel it, but that's not the same feeling you get when you're the head coach. When you're the head coach, I mean, it's, it's sleepless nights, you know, quite constantly questioning yourself. Are you doing the right thing? What can you do to get better? And so it's, it's, it, it, it's, it's tough. It's rewarding. But it's a tough situation um, um, being a head coach. Yeah, you're right. Um, what did you have to give up to achieve your current level of success? Um, I, I think if you know if 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 you if you go back, I, I would think I would probably try to 
manage my time a little bit better with family. I think um, I'm not saying that my job cost me my marriage, but it didn't help. <laughs> You know, and I think if you're going to be in this business and you're married, I, and I tell, I tell young guys this today, you better make sure your wife understands what this is about. And even if they say they do, they really don't. And, um, and, and I don't know if, if that's the direction that you was asking me, but I, I think what I had to give up to get to where I am I would say I had to give up a lot of time with my family. And <clears throat> in this business, I, I, I think that's just like being a doctor or being a lawyer. I think it, the only difference is people think we're having fun and they don't see this as work. Whereas a doctor or lawyer, that's work. They see us bouncing the ball, you know, on TV and all that stuff. And that's, that's fun, but it, it's, this is a very challenging and time consuming profession. And um, your family, for the most part, had, gonna have to sacrifice. And if you can keep that balance, if you can keep that balance, uh, I think that's, that's what you need to strive to do. But, did I, I didn't give up my family, but, I, but, but, but I, I'm saying that if, if there's something lacking in this business that as coaches, I think we all would like to give more time to our families, but this is a very time consuming job. So true, man. Hey, I mean, it's, you, you, your, your answer is right along with everyone else's who answers this question. I mean, that's, the biggest thing. One of the guys that was on the show, he'd been in it for 38 years. He calculated that he probably missed five years spending time with his family. Like, a total of five years is basically a race out of all the time. That's a long time. Yeah. To just be away from your family when you start looking at that. that that's a huge number. Yeah. And this would be kind of like, um, you, you've seen a lot. Uh, you have seen a lot. We don't have to use names, but like, what is the strangest or like, craziest the wildest thing a player has done outside of the basketball court wow <laughs> um we we had a we had a player here who um from new york and and you know most new york guys don't have license they don't drive they take trains and buses and all that. And we had a player here a few years back who got into another player's car, said he could drive, obviously, and drove the car. And he was making a left turn and we, we got it on videotape. It's the funniest thing. He made. He was making a left turn. He was in, a, in going, going, you know, uh, down, down the hill. When he got to the bottom of the hill, he was making a left turn, and he made a wide turn and ran out of a hole, knocked the pole down, and tilted the car on the side. And like I said, we, we, we the person, the person was was filming it as. They were filming something else, but it just happened to catch him. And when he made that left turn and he made a wide turn and he cut the car real sharp, the car hit the side of the pole, knocked the pole up against the house and turned the car on the side. And they had to pull him out of the car. And when they asked him what happened, he blamed it on another player because he was on his way to the other player's house to pick him up, to bring him to class. And he said that if he didn't have to go pick up the player, he would have never ran into the pole. <laughs> but uh, that, that, was, that, that, that was probably one of the 
funniest things that uh, that we've seen that I've seen. And like I said, if you see the video, obviously it'll be it'd be a lot funnier than me telling the story. But um, he he didn't. He, it wasn't his fault that he hit the pole. It wasn't his fault that he turned the car, flipped the car upside down. <laughs> Still laughing at that. Um, biggest accomplishment you have experienced since you've been uh, in college coaching? Uh, biggest accomplishment is probably being a head coach. You know, be, regardless of the wins and the losses, just, you know, I, I think as assistants and I think those that strive to get into this business, I think that's what we all would like to have the opportunity to, to be the head coach. And I, I've been I've been close to a lot of jobs, you know, and this with business finishing second is not <laughs> you know, it doesn't do you any good. But um getting that call and 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 saying that you're gonna be our our next head coach was probably my biggest uh, professional accomplishment, uh, wins and losses. I've been to two Final Fours. You know, um, once you go to a Final Four, you 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 think it's easy, but then you realize the following year and the years after how hard it is to get to a Final Four. And then, as 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 we know. That's our coaches' convention at the Final Four. So prior to prior to going to the Final Four as, as a participant, you look forward to that. But then after you are, uh, uh, you bring a team to the Final Four, and you don't go back with your team, the Final Four is not the same. It's not the same. It's you know it's like, yeah, I'm gonna go to the Final Fours, hang out with my guys. It's a professional development, but that same excitement is not the same as prior to going to the Final Four, uh, you know, with the team. I feel you on that one. This the next question is not a. It's it's kind of like stomp you a little bit, see where you are. Kind of describes, you know, I don't know if you're a big movie or TV show guy. I, know, I mean, you know, you've been basketballs in your blood, but like, what movie or TV show title? best describes your work week, your, your week in general? Oh, wow. TV show. <laughs> huh. mm. well, to be honest with you, really didn't watch a lot of TV until this virus stuff popped up. You know, ESPN Sports Center was, was like, uh, and, and, and CNN News was was like the two things that I pretty much watched prior to the virus. Um, uh, since I've been watching TV a lot, um, I'm, I'm, I'm a big law and order guy. I'm a big law and order guy, uh, trying to, you know, figuring things out, good guy, bad guys. Um, the 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 uh, the work you have to do to to try to find who did what, kind of like correspond or correlate with basketball to kind of figure out who can do certain things on the floor. I think sometimes as coaches, we, we have to be the judge and the jury, you know, with, with our players, you know, and you have to um, you know give the punishment, <laughs> you know, so. Um, I would say law and order. I'm a, I'm a big law and order guy. That's a great answer. I'm a big law and order guy, too. Lenny Briscoe, I mean, I don't yeah. know which one you watch, but I'm, I'm a huge yeah. law and order guy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Briscoe, he, he always has those uh, quick comebacks. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he does. Um, <laughs> what's your, um, you know, you've been in for a while. What's your favorite word or phrase like you might say to the players or? Stuff like that. What's your favorite word or phrase? Do right. Do right. Simple, simple and powerful. I like that. Keep, keep it simple. Just do. I right. like that. Mm -hmm. I like that. We, um, you know, I tell our guys all the time. I said, you know, it's a lot easier if you just do right. 
you know, and you, you, you know, when you, you can always tell, you know, when, when you're, when you're in this business for an extended period of time, you can always tell when a player is not doing what they're supposed to, you know, when they, when they, when they step on that floor, you, you can always tell there's something, something else going on. You know, you, can, you, know, you just, you just feel it, see it in there. And you know the, the way the way they uh, the way they compete, the, the, the way they practice, and their, their their intensity. You know, it's like their mind is somewhere else. You know, and um, you know, same thing I tell my kids. You know, like I said, I, I treat my players like 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 they're my sons, and I just I just tell them, look, we don't have you know I I don't, I don't have a whole lot of rules. You know, I don't have a whole lot of rules. So just just do right and treat people the way you want to be treated. You know, like that, like that. You know, just, What's the, um, obviously you have some great guys you work with. You mentioned that before. Um, what's the best piece of advice you've ever been given? Um, when Ed, Ed Tapscott gave me my first job at American university, you know, uh, for, I mean, you know Tap. Yep. A lot of people out there know Tap. And, um, and sometimes we as, as assistants, we take on the personality of our mentors or, 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 or the, the, uh, the mentality of, um, of our head coach. And Tap is, again, he's not a self-promoter. He, he's very intelligent. He's professional. Um, he, and just watching him, the way he interact with people, <clears throat> that's, that's kind of what I was saying before about treat people the, the way you want to be treated. That comes from him. Yep. That comes from him. You know, you know, like I said, he's not a big self-promoting type guy. And, you know, he, you know, he, 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 people really respect him. We respect him who he is and what he does. And, and he doesn't have to beat his own, you know, toot his own horn. And um, I learned a lot from him. You know, mm -hmm. I learned a lot from him. And then with, with Coach Huggins, you know, he, 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 what you see is not what you, but what you get, so to speak. He, you, he, he's not that person that you see on TV. You know, he's very, it, you know, we have a saying that when you when you cross those lines, it's time to go to work. When you when you back across those lines, you know now okay everything that happened on the floor is on the floor. And um, he doesn't have a whole lot of rules, you know. Like some coaches might have ten rules that the team you got to do this, got to do that, got to do that. I, I think from being with him at Cincinnati and being with him here at West Virginia that do right philosophy that I have, um, I think that comes from him, you know, because, Love. you know, he, he, you know, people think that he's a screamer, yeller, always in God's face. That's, is he intense? Yes. But the reason why guys love him and guys come back and guys talk about him in such a positive way is because he's, he's just another, he's a human being. He, gotcha. So, uh, these are, I'm going to end up with this. These last couple, important, I think it is for you. Uh, I could be here all day with you, man. You, you got some great knowledge. When you um, when you get another shot at being a head coach, because I think that's going to happen. That, I mean, are there any changes uh, you would make from the type of staff or style of play or type of players you have from when you were at Hartford? Like, like what 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 would those things be? I think the, the I think the one thing that I would do is, is that I, I think you gotta, I would have more patience. I would have more patience. You know, um, I, I think the first time around, you know, when you start to struggle a little bit, you, you, you start making changes and you start maybe getting a little bit out of your character or out of your philosophy. And you, and you said, well, let's try this and let's try that and let's try this. And I think 
if I'm fortunate enough to get another opportunity, it goes back to what Bob Huggins told me the first time, make sure it looks like you. And, and, and I think I got away from that a little bit because it, it, it didn't look like me at first. And so I started putting other things in it. And then, I, then you try to go back to making it look like you. And then it ends up not. And so I, I think when I, when I was let go at Hartford, I think I, I had it back together. But I think if I had to take that journey all over again in all six years, obviously you're always going to tweak things that you do, but your basic philosophy you know, your style of play on the offense and defense, uh, the, type, the type of coach that you have when you interact with your players. I think you got to be consistent with that. And then when it's all said and done, if, 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 if you're not successful, at least you know you did it your way. And I think sometimes as coaches, and I know it, like in my case, sometimes it didn't look like me, and I tried to take other things that I, not necessarily I didn't believe in, but I thought it would help. But if I look back on it, if I would have stayed the course, I think it would have been a lot better. Awesome. Now, and, and then this last question, the counter, you already used patience. So I'm going to just go back to one from the beginning. Knowing what you know now, what would you tell your – young self to prepare for this business of college coaching? Um, network a lot more. You know, I, I, I think, I, I think and again, in my case, I was so work driven. I was so focused on my job. You know, some, sometimes, sometimes, um, the amount of time you put into something is not what you get out of it. And um, if, if I had to do this over again, beside my work ethic, I would, I would network a lot more because I think networking, when you're talking about moving up in the business, you know, it's, it's not necessarily it's what you know, it's who you know. And, and I know there was times when when I got the job at Cincinnati, the other assistant coach said, hey, come on, let's go golfing. I'm like, no, man, I got to make these last calls. Or I got to write these letters. Or, hey, man, we're going, we're going to sports bar and we're going to meet such and such. Okay, I'll meet you guys there. And I end up in, in the office making calls, writing letters. And not that you, you can't do that, but I think as an assistant coach, especially when you're young in this business, I think you got to have a balance, always work, but also understand that networking and relationships is very important in this business. And um, I tell young guys this today all the time. I said, you know, hey, you, 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 go, you, go to a, you go to a gym, you know, it's good to – Say hi to the guy that you, <clears throat> every now and then sitting next to somebody that you don't know, you know, and just hey, thanks, Larry. You know, they can see that you coach wherever you coach and just have a little conversation because you know, just as well as I do, when coaches walk in the door, you know, either we know them or we don't, or we heard something about them, maybe positive or negative but we really don't know the person until you really get to meet them and get to know them. And so that's why networking and relationships are so important when you first start in this business, because that person that you just met, his head coach might need someone. And especially I tell African-American coaches, I said, you know, and, and it's, it's not, anything negative, but a lot of these white coaches don't know us. They don't know a lot of us. And so you, you don't have to go and kiss up on, you know, to anyone, but in this business, it's who you know. 
you know, and networking and relationships are so important. So starting out in this business, still do your job, make sure you're organized and you do your job, but also have some time to develop off the floor professionally also, because, you know, a lot of times, again, they see us as African-Americans as just recruiters and not as coaches. And the reason why they don't look at us as coaches is because they don't get a chance to talk to us. You know, they don't get the, the only time we talk, they talk is about a player. Ask, ask someone that you don't know about a play, about the defensive philosophy, about what you do, what they do. You know, one, one thing as coaches that you know as well as I do, one thing that we all like to do is talk about basketball. You know, and, and I think we, you know, when you first start in this business, it's important that you, you build relationships and, and, and networking is, 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 is just as important <laughs> as, as what you do on the floor. So true. You know, and, 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 and I, don't, I don't think early on in my career, like I'm not a self-promoter, I don't think I did enough of that because I was, I was so focused on doing my job and not developing myself as a coach, as a total coach, instead of just, you know, make sure I make that phone call, make sure I write that letter, you know? And, and so that's, that, that would be my advice. Awesome, man, awesome. So man, uh, Coach Harrison, I wanna thank you again, man, for being a guest on the show and being unmasked. Like I said, I could have kept going on and on. It's just so easy, the conversation. Um, and then, so I wanna thank the viewers for watching another great show. Stay tuned for the next guests as we get them unmasked. See you next time and stay safe. Thanks, Lamar. I appreciate it. Thanks for, thanks for having me on.